The once proud Magnavox brand was born in Northern California in 1917. The founders had literally invented the loudspeaker. The speaker. No kidding. They went on to be prominent players in the two most popular electronics products of the 20th century, radios and televisions. So how did they come to this? Magnavox made radios, televisions, phonographs, and stereos. Their products and their brand were highly regarded and widely respected, as is generally the consequence of a company founded by inventors and engineers who desired first to make good things and secondarily to make money doing it. With brand new transistor technology emerging in the mid-1950s, Magnavox issued its first transistor radio, the AM2, in 1956. But then, shortly after that, Magnavox management made the decisions that would eventually lead to the company's demise. All manner of spin was put on those decisions then and now obscuring the real reasons for the company's failure and serving instead the agenda of whoever was telling the story. But their products do not lie, and their transistor radio line tells the story more honestly than anything else. Have a look at these. These are a couple of Magnavox transistor radios from the early 1960s, made just five years after their first transistor radio. What happened? If you're not a collector of these things, you might not see any big deal here. These radios don't look so bad, and they're smaller than that first one, and so would fit in a pocket. That's progress. But beneath the surface of this apparent progress, there was a transformation at Magnavox in these years that proved ultimately fatal. The once proud firm was probably quite proud still of these early 60s models, and that would be the problem. Proud that in these few years they had shipped the American jobs that built their radios overseas to the Far East so they could undercut their American competitors. Proud that they could outsource their research and development budget, too, by just letting the foreign suppliers absorb the costs and risks. Proud that they had taken the low road and stripped away any interesting design from these products that might have cost a penny or two per unit. Pride, always a short-term enterprise, collapsed for Magnavox when in the 1960s Hong Kong got into the radio market in the United States with even less expensive radios, and Magnavox learned the hard way that cost-cutting was not a strategy for success. Meanwhile, Business was good for the Nippon Electric Company, who made these radios for Magnavox. NEC, unlike Magnavox, was focused on the future. They'd take Magnavox's money, while it lasted, and build them a good product. It wasn't NEC's problem that Magnavox was more focused on next quarter's earnings than on providing customer value. It wasn't that hard to make a stylish product, but you don't make one pinching pennies. While Magnavox laid off workers and saved money here and there, NEC took a different path. And where did those paths lead? Today, NEC's annual revenue, as of 2021, was $27 billion, with 114,700 employees worldwide. And where is Magnavox? Where are their factories and employees? Nowhere. Within a dozen or so years of the appearance of these radios, Magnavox as we knew it was gone. Since 1974, Magnavox exists as nothing more than a brand name owned by the Dutch company Philips. Philips has so little use for it that they license out the Magnavox name to Funai Electric of Japan, and they stick it on the front of TVs and accessories that you can find today at places like Walmart and Walgreens. No, the classic American brand Magnavox doesn't belong to any actual American Magnavox company. Yeah, boys. 
You can take the flag down now. What happened to Magnavox? Well, I've got 49 Magnavox transistor radios in my collection, and these are the best-looking ones. Not great. That was part of the problem at Magnavox, but other forces were at work, too, in American business at the time, forces that, in the end, resulted in virtually zero American-made consumer electronics brands surviving past the early 1970s. We'll get to those forces in a minute, but right now let's talk a little bit about Funai, the makers of the stuff available today with the Magnavox brand on it. I don't want to be unfair to them. I'm sure this stuff is decent. Is it on the cutting edge? Well, as a consumer, judging on appearances, their products look to me to have bland, colorless, me-too styling that is utterly conventional. So, I would say that no, their products are obviously not cutting edge. But decent, probably. Now, they're a Japanese company, making the things they sell, where else? In China, mostly. So, why do they use the Magnavox name? Doesn't it seem dishonest to fool the poor boomers into thinking they are buying American when they buy Magnavox? Because, let's not kid ourselves, that's the point. Most of these boomer customers don't even care, of course, about buying American. But there's at least some little value they are seeing in that name Magnavox that is not really honestly there in these products. Collecting transistor radios has shown me things I never learned in any formal study of economics. So I've got something to say about that, about what really happened to Magnavox and the other American-made consumer electronics brands. Some of you establishment types are not going to like what I have to say. Sorry. Turn this off if it feels like a threat to hear an unauthorized point of view. So back when I started collecting radios, lots of preconceived notions started to fall. The more I learned, the more they fell. We'd been taught in 1950s America that Japanese products were cheaply made junk. And since I was only a small child then, I naturally absorbed the traditional so-called wisdom. Well, the first lesson in collecting these little radios is that that was simply not so. The Japanese radios are, these 50 and 60 years later, at least as likely to look good and to still work as their American counterparts, or for that matter, their Italian, English, and German counterparts. And the Japanese radios were pretty. No one put more into the design and styling of these little things than the Japanese makers. Another preconceived notion that fell was this idea that cheap labor in the Far East was the principal reason for the demise of the American transistor radio and consumer electronics brands. But how could that be, when these brands were some of the first to outsource production to take advantage of this cheaper labor? They closed their American factories, told their American workers to take a hike, and still blew it. No, the more I got into this, the more it became obvious that the American brands did this to themselves. In a few particular ways. Cost-cutting was one way. Cutting costs like research and development, design and product quality is not a strategy that will end well. Complacency was another way. Management that failed to see any reason to relate to the huge emerging baby boom market. And then there were those who chose to focus on short-term profits, mergers, acquisitions, and the other Wall Street machinations that produce commissions and fees for Wall Street, but nothing of any actual value to consumers. Sound familiar? Oh yes, all these things, and the outsourcing, we still complain about today as if they are new problems we can solve. They're not new, nor are they problems in the sense that those involved are looking to solve them. They are not bugs in the system. They are features of the system. 
and the especially egregious I saved for last. I'm talking about those companies who abandoned their legacies in consumer electronics for the easy money of the perpetual war machine. Like Magnavox. Oh yeah, they did that. And these war profiteers, who were a transistor pioneer and used to innovate for the living, who now put their efforts into finding more efficient ways to kill. In the 1950s and 60s, the American consumer electronics brands General Electric, Hoffman, Raytheon, Magnavox, and others increasingly turned their backs on the consumer market feeding instead at the Pentagon's massive trough of blood money. As this was going on, the Japanese, prevented by law from spending much of anything on the military as a result of World War II, simply saw the languishing American consumer electronics industry and took it. And that's why Magnavox could have, but didn't give us Trinitron TV, as Sony did, or the flat-screen TV, and why Raytheon didn't give us the Walkman ten years earlier than Sony, or ever, and the General Electric iPhone? Where's that? Sometimes you hear it said that military spending drives innovation, but that's an argument that fails to understand or deliberately ignores the far greater opportunities missed in the pursuit of war. Think of it this way. That American-made Walkman that might have existed in 1969, the Air Force dropped that on Cambodia. And your first laptop, that was dropped on Vietnam in 1972. Oh, and nationwide broadband and universal free Wi-Fi. That blew up in Afghanistan ten years ago. What other things can't we have? A balanced federal budget? Nope. Not when the federal government spends $800 billion on the military each year. How about world peace? Why can't we have that? Everybody wants that. Sorry, no. The board of directors at Raytheon voted it down.